The video games market is projected to make over $280 billion by the end of 2024, with researchers predicting this will rise to $363 billion by 2027. Over 53% of American households own a games console, according to a study carried out in 2020. We don't need to do the math, but we can all agree that's a lot of consoles. I'm Senor Dona, and today we'll be taking a look at five of the best-selling consoles, ranging from the early generations up until modern times. Without further ado, let us begin. The first console we'll be looking at is the Sega Game Gear. In 1989, Michael Katz, the CEO of Sega America, decided it was time to develop a handheld console. But what was his reason for opting for a handheld? Well, that's easy to answer. It was the Nintendo Game Boy. The Game Boy had released earlier that year in 1989, selling over 1 million units in the United States within a few weeks. Michael could see the dollar signs and wanted to develop a console to rival the Game Boy. The Game Gear was designed to be a portable version of Sega's Master System, which was also a commercial success. The Game Gear would feature a full-colour screen, which technically was superior to the LCD being used in the Game Boy. It was also modelled to be more ergonomic and was shaped similarly to the Sega Genesis controller or Mega Drive depending on where you're from. The Game Gear was marketed as the cooler version of the Game Boy, but there was controversy with some of Sega's advertisements. These adverts would liken Game Boy users to being overweight and having a low IQ. This caused a backlash, and Nintendo would protest these commercials, saying they were disrespectful to disabled individuals. The Game Gear used the same CPU as the Master System, featured a 3.5 to inch screen and was powered by six AA batteries. The battery life ranged from three to five hours, which was considerably less than Game Boy's 30 hour range. Sega knew they couldn't compete with the Game Boy's battery life, so they decided to release some external rechargeable battery packs to ease the restraint on customers' wallets. The Game Gear was released in Japan in October 1990 and sold over 90,000 units within a month and a further 600,000 units in back orders. It would later be released in the USA and Europe in 1991, with Australia getting it lost in 1992. The console sold over 10.6 million units worldwide. You could also buy a TV tuner that could be placed into the cartridge slot which made the Game Gear a portable TV. This would set you back an additional $130 though. This wasn't the only peripheral for the console. You could also purchase a super wide gear which magnified the screen. A car adapter which plugged into the car's cigarette lighter which provided power whilst on the go and finally the Master Gear which let you play Master System games. And now, a brief minute to look at today's sponsor. Oh, oh wait, that's right, uh, I don't have a sponsor yet. Okay, f*** it, well on to console 2 then. Number 2 on the list is the Nintendo GameCube. But before we can discuss the GameCube's development, we'll need to go back a few more years and you'll understand why shortly. Silicon Graphics, or SGI, was a high-performance-based manufacturer of computer software and hardware. In 1993, they were approached by Nintendo to develop the Graphic Processing Unit, or GPU, for the N64. The engineer that led the development team for the 64's GPU was Dr. Wei Yen. In 1997, Wei Yen and 20 other employees decided to leave SGI, with Wei forming a new company called ArtX. In 1998, Nintendo approached Wei Yen to develop a GPU for their next-generation console. Both parties agreed and a partnership was formed. But what did this mean? Well, this meant that Nintendo's sixth generation of console was about to go in the oven, and that console was, of course, the Nintendo GameCube. Nintendo approached IBM to develop the console CPU, which was codenamed Gecko. The Gecko was a 32-bit processor which ran at 486 MHz and was based on IBM's PowerPC 750 CPU range. Nintendo also made the decision to abandon the cartridge system used in their previous consoles and opted for a mini DVD disc that could store up to 1.5 GB of data. This allowed games to be far larger in size as the previous console, the N64, could only store 64 MB of data on each cartridge. On May 1999, Nintendo would announce the GameCube to the world as a replacement to the N64. Well, that's not entirely true. Its codename was the Dolphin, and this is the name that Nintendo gave to the press. A year later, in August 2000, Nintendo held another press conference and finally revealed the console as the Nintendo GameCube. Fast forward to E3 of 2001, also RIP E3, gone but never forgotten baby, Nintendo would reveal the games that would launch with the console. You may have heard of some of them. There was Crazy Taxi, Super Monkey Ball, and Luigi's Mansion. In September 2001, the GameCube was released in Japan, the United States in November, and the rest of the world in May 2002. The launch price of the console was $200, which was cheaper than its rivals, the PS2 and Xbox, by $100. Nintendo also spent a whopping $76 million on marketing the GameCube. But how did this translate into sales? Well, let's find out. In Japan, the console sold 300,000 units within the first three days, having 450,000 units in stock. In the United States, over $100 million of sales was made in the first weekend alone. 
home. The GameCube was a hit, and you'd have a tough time finding one as at launch they were essentially sold out. The console would go on to sell approximately 22 million units worldwide, with more than half of these being sold off in the United States. In November 2006, Nintendo released the Wii, discontinuing the GameCube worldwide in 2007. Next, we'll be looking at the Atari 2600, aka the VCS. In 1973, Atari acquired Sign Engineering, who were a computer engineering team based in Green Valley, California. Science founders Steve Mayer and Larry Emmons believed that a home console could be developed that could play Atari's current selection of arcade games utilizing programmable microprocessors. Their main concern was the cost of the processors. They'd cost up to $300 to manufacture, making them too costly to purchase, let alone developing an entire console. Atari's first generation home Pong console was only capable of playing one game, Pong, obviously, so their goal was to develop a console that could play a variety of games and stepping away from their former custom circuit boards. In September 1975, MOS Technology unveiled their new 6502 processor at a trade show at a price of $25. But can you guess who also attended the trade show? Steve Mayer. He wanted to use the 6502 chip to develop Atari's next home console. After several meetings between the two parties, there was still one major concern. $25 was still too expensive, but they were eager to strike a deal. MOS proposed an alternative processor, the 6507, as well as their Riot chip for a combined total of $12 a pair. In October 1975, the deal was agreed and the development process for the 2600 was truly underway. By 1976, the 2600 was in its second prototype stage and featured a ROM cartridge slot, an adapter as well as a chip that would send audio and graphics to a home television. The development of the console was going well, but they still needed to design the cartridges that the game would be stored on. The cartridges would share several similarities with the Fairchild Channel F console. That was due to Douglas Hardy, a former Fairchild engineer, joining Atari and being part of the development team. However, they would need to make slight changes as Atari didn't want to lean on the Channel F's patent and create legal troubles for themselves. The 2600 was revealed on the 4th of June 1977 and released a year later in September within the States. At launch, the console would set you back $200, came with two joysticks and one game. Combat. Combat claimed to have 27 video games in the cartridge, but realistically they were all the same game with slight variations. It sold approximately 400,000 units within the first three months, and this was only within the United States. The 2600 released in Europe in 1978, France in 1982, and Japan receiving a different version in 1983 called the Atari 2800. By 1983, the console had sold over 12 million units, with 120 million cartridges being sold worldwide. The 2600 also had some great games that further boosted the sales of the console. These included Pac-Man, Space Invaders, as well as Donkey Kong. Yes, that's right, Donkey Kong was once on a non-Nintendo-based system. In total, the 2600 sold 30 million units worldwide and was discontinued in 1992 after being on the market for 15 years. At number 4 is the PC Engine, aka the TurboGrafx-16, to those based in the United States. In the 1980s, NEC, a Japanese-based IT and electronics company, wanted to enter the gaming console market. Their home computers were selling extremely well, consisting of the PC-88 as well as the PC-98 with the latter selling over 18 million units. NEC had a notable reputation around the world for their hardware and believed the gaming console market was a natural progression to push the company forward. NEC lacked the knowledge to develop a console, so they contacted several game studios to see if they could form a partnership. In July 1987, NEC approached Hudson Soft, a game studio that had previously worked with Nintendo developing games such as Bomberman, Load Runner, and would later go on to develop the first eight Mario parties. Both companies came to an agreement and the development of the PC Engine would begin. NEC would develop the motherboard for the PC Engine with Hudson Soft developing the CPU, video display controller, as well as the game cartridges called Hue Cards. Hue Cards were unique cartridges that were small and resembled the shape of a credit card. The Hue Card was an improved version of their former cartridge, the B Card, and this was a storage device used for personal computers. The PC Engine released in Japan on the 30th of October 1987. The Japanese audience were receptive to the console with it selling 500,000 units within the first week. As the console was selling so well, NEC wanted to expand on its features. A CD-ROM peripheral was developed that would allow the PC Engine to play CD-ROMs as well as the Hue cards. Did you know that the PC Engine was the first console to utilize CD-ROMs as a storage medium? I'm going to assume that you said no, and don't worry because I didn't either. But how did the CD-ROM expansion sell? Well, it sold 60,000 units within the first five months and considered a commercial success. By 1989, the NEC sold 1.2 million PC engines and over 80,000 CD-ROM devices. NEC wanted to launch the console in the United States and conducted some research on the American market. They discovered the 
name PC Engine wasn't popular as well as how the console looked. They decided to rebrand the PC Engine as the Turbo Graphics 16 and redesigned the console in a black finish. The Turbo Graphic released in the United States in August 1989 with over 750 units being produced. However, the sales weren't great, and this was further amplified by the release of the Sega Genesis, which released two weeks prior. Due to the console selling poorly in the United States, NEC decided to cancel its European release. But sales did pick up in the United States as by March 1991 they'd sold over 750,000 units. The PC Engine and Turbo Graphics sold a combined total of 6.5 million units worldwide and 2 million CD-ROM units sold in Japan. The console was discontinued in 1994 following NEC's release of their new console, the PC FX. At number 5 and the last console on the list... The Sony PlayStation. The PlayStation origins begin with a man named Ken Kutaragi, who worked for Sony as an executive. Ken decided to approach Nintendo without Sony's knowledge and convince him to use a sound processor that he developed, which he thought would be a perfect fit for the SNES. This nearly got Ken fired, but Sony's president, Norio Oga, saw something in Ken and decided to keep him on. Nintendo and Sony would go into a partnership and Ken's sound processor would be used in the SNES. Because this partnership was so successful, Nintendo wanted Sony to develop a CD-ROM peripheral that can be used in conjunction with the Super Nintendo. Nintendo had two names in mind for this peripheral. The first was the SNES CD, and the second was the PlayStation. The PlayStation was set to be announced in 1991, but Nintendo's president Hiroshi Yamauchi believed Sony would have too much control over the console. He decided to cancel the contract, and this was a key moment in the PlayStation's origins. After Nintendo cancelled the contract, Sony said f*** it, we'll make our own console. In 1992, Norio Oga, the CEO of Sony, held a meeting with Ken and several other executives. Ken proposed his new LSI chip that could support 3D graphics and would be the perfect fit for a home console. He was ridiculed by the Sony executives, claiming that home consoles were toys for children. However, Norio Oga thought that Ken was onto something and believed in his project. The PlayStation project was then given the green light and Sony were all in. Ken and nine other employees from Sony's music division were assigned to work on the PlayStation. Ken met with Sony Records founder Shigeo Mariyama, who pointed out that because the PlayStation would utilize the CD-ROM format, the audio quality would be terrific. Sony considered using 2D graphics but believed the console's hardware was powerful enough to display 3D polygon based graphics. Senior Sony executives were still not happy with developing the PlayStation as they thought it would diminish their reputation by creating a toy for children. The PlayStation was announced on May 10th 1994 and later released in Japan on the 3rd of December 1994. The PlayStation sold 100,000 units on day one and would sell 2 million units within six months. This was causing Sega concerns as their Saturn had only released a week before the PlayStation. The console would launch in the United States on the 9th of September 1995, with the entire 100,000 units being sold out within two days. I'll repeat that again. Every single PlayStation that was shipped to the United States was sold out immediately. They would later be released in Europe and Australia in 1995, but they had a big problem. They were selling out faster than they could make them. Sony would have to increase their production of the PlayStation as well as charter jets to get the consoles to their destination as quickly as possible. The PlayStation was the first console to sell over 100 million units, selling a total of 102.5 million units worldwide. It was retired in 2006, and notice I didn't say discontinued, and that was due to it being gaming royalty. It wasn't discontinued, it simply left the race after winning the Grand Prix. Ladies and gents, subs and non-subs, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. You've heard it all a million times. All of my socials can be found in my description. And remember, I'll never be a real YouTuber until I've released an apology video, or two. That's all guys, peace out.